I've tested quite a few cameras now, but for some photo shoots I've been limited by geography. Utah is not what you'd call a destination for viewing the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights, but this month North America experienced a storm that would make history. In the past there have been reports in my home state suggesting you might catch a glimpse of polar particle activity, but I can tell you firsthand that those headlines were little more than sensationalized clickbait. On one occasion a few years ago, I did catch the faintest glow of green on the northern horizon while standing at the absolute tip of the state. At the time, this was the best I'd ever captured. Just last year was my first time having any real success with hunting the northern lights, but I was well into Idaho to see them. I was pretty proud of the outcome, even though I never saw any color with my actual eyes, just these whitish wisps that slowly twisted in the sky. And when I shoot on the go, I take the A6500, a compact and very travel-friendly APS-C camera made by Sony. And it honestly has done a great job at capturing my night sky time lapses over the years. But what would I bring if I had the choice? Which model is the ultimate Northern Lights camera? The answer to that question will mostly come down to the ability to shoot dark scenes. While consensus may be a strong word, there is a compelling plurality of photographers and product reviewers who will tell you Sony is the king of low light performance. Quite honestly, that was a major factor in why I chose to go with the A6500 when I bought it. Now a dated model, and certainly not from a flagship product line, we have to consider what is at the top in the current year. Well, it just so happened that for one weekend I had in my possession the A7R5 and the A7S III, the two top Sony choices by professionals in my field. As you guys know, I've shot with both in the past, but this was my first real hands-on night shooting experience with the S model, something I've been excited to try out for a while. If Sony is the king, then the A7S III is the crown jewel if these thumbnails are to be believed. Well, we're going to find out. Funny enough, it wasn't my plan to shoot the Northern Lights on the weekend in question, but that's just kind of the nature of the Aurora. It shows up fast, and despite some great efforts to forecast it, no one really knows for sure where, when, or how long it will last and how strong it will be. Opportunity knocked at the door, and I wasn't passing it up. Driving north just as I passed Brigham City, Utah, the light pollution faded, but a haze on the horizon persisted, and I was sure I knew what I was seeing. Never had I seen it this far south, and to my utter delight, this was the first time I could see real vibrant color with my own eyes, but I had no time to lose if we were going to find out what these cameras can see. The A7S III is primarily a video camera. That's not to say that the A7R5 doesn't have some advantages of its own in the video department if we're comparing the two, but let's find out what each one offers in terms of technology for this use case. This is not a time lapse. This is actual video coming right out of the A7S III. As many of you who have experienced fighting dark scenes will already know, that's pretty crazy. Seriously, not every camera can do what you're seeing here. Switching over to the A7R5, well, we may have already answered our question here. This is using the same camera settings and 85 millimeter lens, but we are definitely not getting the same results. So what's going on here? Well, because the A7S III is purpose-built for video, it doesn't have a large megapixel spec, but it's still a full-frame camera, so what that means is each of these pixels is larger than most other cameras in its class. On top of that, Sony engineers a dual-native ISO into every one of their mirrorless cameras. It's a pretty cool concept, and fortunately a feature that is catching on among other brands as well. Dual-native ISO essentially means that instead of one base ISO, you actually get a clean start for ISO noise at a second, higher level. Now for the R model, that's ISO 100 and ISO 320, the same as many other Sony cameras. But for the S model, the second number is at 1600. Here's how that looks in practice. You can see a sudden, complete loss of noise when switching from ISO 1250 to 1600. That's wild, a brighter, more usable picture at the higher value. But it doesn't stop there for the A7S III. Sony has also just put a lot of engineering into noise reduction at ridiculously high ISO levels when shooting video with this model. How do they do that? Uh, um, magic. So while it's not perfect, it's really impressive what it can do, but you can see that for yourself. Okay, but not all video is just video. We could also be shooting an interval and turning that into a time-lapse video. So how do these compare if we switch over to photos? Well, there you have it. Same settings, same lens, and not really a contest, is it? The A7R5 is still one of the most impressive low-light shooters in the market and has run away with the win in some of my other comparisons, but today it may have met its match. I did not shoot a time-lapse side-by-side -side with these two cameras, and now I wish I had. Again, I was totally caught off guard by this celestial event. But here is a time-lapse I captured near the end of the night's light show using the A7S III. 
These are one second exposures at ISO 6400. And as I described earlier, the noise is very manageable. We honestly could have gone a lot higher on the ISO, something that I will explain in more depth in a later video. But this seemed like the perfect coupling of exposure and ISO in the moment. What do you guys think though? Not bad, eh? For a quick comparison, here is a single frame I did capture immediately afterward with the A7R5. And while it's not the exact same moment in the sky, this would still seem to confirm the results of the earlier examples. Less noise and more light captured by the S model. All right, let's take a look at one more time lapse. This is definitely the best time lapse of the Aurora Borealis that I've ever taken. Ah, uh, but wait, this wasn't taken by the A7S III or the A7R5. I shot these frames on the trusty A6500. The only reason this is brighter and more vibrant is because I shot it at the height of the storm's activity, which just goes to show that you can get great things with any professional camera, which is something I try to say in every one of my videos. But if I was contracted to go someplace like Norway to collect professional video of the Northern Lights, I think this test has convinced me that I'd be reaching for the A7S III, and that's my official recommendation to you. But what do you guys think? Is Sony the king of low light? Or is there another manufacturer you'd suggest is outperforming them? Let me know in the comments. And let me know if you were able to capture some cool shots of this month's Aurora. I think it's crazy how much of the United States got to see it this time. As you guys know, we are heading right back into Milky Way season, so stay tuned for more videos on that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.